Hello everyone, welcome back to my show, The Interview. I'm your host, Susan Lee McDonald. Most foreigners' conception of the Korean wave, or Hallyu, is usually attributed to modern Korean culture, including K-pop, K-cuisine, and dramas. Our guest today is Professor Emmanuel Pastryk, a professor at Kyung University who's been in Korea for over seven years. Now, he's got some very interesting ideas about Korean culture and how to share that with the rest of the world. Join me as I interview Emmanuel Pastryk. Welcome to my show, Emmanuel. Thank you very so much. nice to meet you. It's a pleasure. And uh, I'm so curious about a lot of the things that you do. I mean, you are not only a professor at Kyung University, but you seem to be putting your hands in a lot of different <laughs> pots. <Yes. laughs> so, could you describe to me kind of what you are involved in? Well, I, of course, I am teaching mm -hmm. here. Uh, I've been writing quite a lot lately, mm -hmm. both in Korean and in English. Uh, and I guess uh, I would summarize it to say that there's just enormous potential in Korea in terms of its culture, in terms of the vibrant culture today, the sometimes undiscovered culture of the past, uh, and moreover, that Korea is increasingly playing such an important role globally. People from all over uh, the world are coming to benchmark Korea. Mm -hmm. It's a very exciting time to be here. Yeah, definitely. And I know I love being here in Korea and having been back in Korea for the past couple of years. It's just a really vibrant place to be, don't you agree? Absolutely. It's what, the place. Yeah. Now, your focus uh, as a professor at Kyung University is uh, particularly what subject? So my original field mm -hmm. was basically novels, China, Japan, mm -hmm. and Korea mm -hmm. for the 17th, 18th century. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I ended up in the school, the College of International Studies. Mm -hmm. uh, so I teach a general introduction to Asian culture, mm -hmm. China, Japan, and Korea, in English, mm -hmm. uh, culture and history. And then I also teach a class in public diplomacy, mm -hmm. so international relations, with a focus on culture. Mm -hmm. Well, you've studied a number of different Asian uh, countries' cultures and literature and languages. Um, uh, would you say that you're uh, somewhat of an Asiaphile? Uh, well, you could say that. Mm -hmm. I didn't start with Korea, mm -hmm. uh, but Korea seems to be the best balance. If you do China, Japan, mm -hmm. and Korea, mm -hmm. you can enjoy a little bit of, of all those cultures here. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Korea has been sort of inspiring. I, I think maybe it comes from, of course, I'm not Asian or, or originally at all, uh, but there's a sense in a, in a lot of the West today that the 
Western culture, is, civilization has lost some of its vitality, uh, and that Asia has been blooming. And among all the countries in Asia, in terms of democracy, in terms of sort of a egalitarian open society, mm -hmm. Korea really has been the most impressive. Definitely. So you studied East Asian literature, um, mm -hmm. and uh, you also, uh, I would guess, um, had some uh, impetus to study uh, Asian literature from the get-go. What was that impetus? Well, so there was a personal experience okay. that's part of that. I, uh, although I'm from the Midwest in mm -hmm. the United States, from St. Louis, and then I taught at University of Illinois, mm -hmm. I went to high school in San Francisco, mm. and my high school was probably about 75% Asian, so okay. I had a lot of <laughs> Asian friends back there, and mm -hmm. I used to being minority uh, from early on, mm -hmm. uh, feel comfortable around Asians. Uh, and then when I went to university, I was thinking very hard about what to major in, mm. Uh, and I thought that uh, China seemed, even then, this is back in 1983 when dinosaurs roamed the earth <laughs> in those days. <laughs> so long ago, right? <laughs> so long ago. Uh, I thought that, uh, you know, that there was some potential here in Asia. I wasn't sure exactly what it was. Mm -hmm. And then I got excited when mm -hmm. I started to actually do the studies. So now, with, um, with your interest in not only uh, Korean culture and literature, uh, we can't avoid the fact that you speak what, five languages, is that right? Something like that. <laughs> <laughs> no, not perfectly, but so, I try. So with those uh, different languages, mm -hmm. um, you must have some insight into how easy or difficult it is to pick up a, a non-Western uh, non language. Uh, so how would you suggest for people who want to study Asian languages or just multiple languages? Right. Right. So I, for all those of you who are not native speakers of English, I feel your pain. I know what it's like. I did my master's degree in Japanese. Uh, and I, I think the most important, there, there are two principles, I would say. The first mm -hmm. is you should not be afraid to repeat things. Mm -hmm. That it's better to take one paragraph and get it down perfectly than it is to try and read 100 pages. Because once you have some part of the, down, the language down perfectly, mm -hmm. you can build on that much more easily than if you go too broadly mm -hmm. too early. Mm -hmm. uh, and the second part is I think that environment is the most critical. So when I, in the case of Korean, I came to Korean when I was, I came to Korea to study seriously when I was 31. So it was a bit late uh, in my career and in my language acquisition skills. Uh, the way I did it was I decided I was not going to have any English speaking friends uh, for the first year. Uh, and that was a rough decision, right? I mean, I didn't speak Korean all that well. Uh, and it spent a lot of time alone. That must have been difficult. It was difficult. But I, by that time, having learned three languages before, I knew that you had to do that. Because if you end up in Korea and you're surrounded by either Koreans who speak to you in English or other foreigners who speak to you in English, your rate of learning is going to be much slower. Mm -hmm. So you would be better off speaking, finding some Korean, even if it's the ajima from, you know, the, from the umshikjam, from, from the local restaurant, mm -hmm. who's willing to actually speak to you in Korean, yes. than you are to just keep speaking English as you always have with your buddies. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would say those are two essential elements. I see. Switching topics just a little bit, uh, you translated the short stories of uh, Park Ji Won, and I'm curious uh, that you decided to translate uh, this, these short stories, these classical novels from the Chosun period. Uh, mm -hmm. What was your inspiration for wanting to do that? Well, I had enjoyed his novels. Just mm -hmm. I read them when writing my dissertation, mm -hmm. I thought that they had the most potential to appeal to a broad audience mm -hmm. uh, overseas. They have incredible depth and sophistication mm -hmm. and some unique characteristics. For example, Pak Ji Won made uh, people of very low mimetic, sort of a low class background as the protagonist. So mm -hmm. he has stories in which the protagonist is a beggar or mm -hmm. a poor farmer or sort of charlatan figures. And so he sort of shows the whole variety of, of Korean society from different perspectives. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was truly unique. So I, I think his novels uh, have this sort of 
quality that can be truly appreciated. Mm -hmm. I imagine that it wasn't easy to translate that into English. And I'm curious how you managed to first do the translations. And um, do you feel like they were uh, up to your satisfaction at the end? Uh, well, that's a very tough question. <laughs> uh, I would say they're not easy. And uh, Pak Ji Won's writings are inherently difficult. Mm. Uh, they're, it, it's first, it's in literary Chinese, with Han Moon. So it's not uh, Korean at all. And they use, he uses many terms which are Chinese in origin, mm -hmm. but which were used for very specific meanings within the context of 18th century mm -hmm. Seoul mm -hmm. or Korea. So it's not always so easy to know exactly what he meant. And in many cases, I would look at the Korean contemporary translations in, in Hangul, yes. uh, but still was not mm -hmm. totally clear what, what, what uh, Pak Ji Won meant. So mm -hmm. I wish I could have spent another couple more years on the book mm -hmm. myself. But I think we did reasonably well in terms of getting the, the, the essence of the stories. Mm -hmm. Now, it seems that you're more interested in classical literature as opposed to modern literature. And uh, would you consider yourself a more uh, uh, classical, traditional <laughs> person? <laughs> uh, I'm less qualified to speak meaningfully about contemporary Korean literature. I think that's accurate. I'm interested in contemporary Korean culture in general or society in general. Uh, but my tendency has been to say, these are these tremendous institutions of the Chosun period. Mm -hmm. How can we bring them up to date and use them in contemporary society? That, that, that's been really the way in which I've looked at the path. I see. From, from my understanding, um, you really like to uh, look into Korean culture and Korean history, Korean literature, um, and bring that to a mo more modern audience. Exactly, um, exactly. Why is it that you really look to the past uh, to bring to the present? Right, well that's exactly what uh, I, I would say is the, the approach. Mm -hmm. it's, it's something like uh, the Renaissance model. So mm -hmm. if you looked at, say, Italy, Florence, uh, uh, in the uh, 16th century, mm -hmm. Uh, they said, let's go back to the past of Rome and Greece, this great tradition. Uh, but in fact, if you see what they did, say what mm -hmm. Michelangelo does in the Sistine Chapel, mm -hmm. in fact, they did things which were totally unprecedented. Mm -hmm. I mean, those buildings are not like anything that the Romans or Greeks had built. Mm -hmm. So I think if we look at Korea today, mm -hmm. uh, it has reached a very high level of sophistication in terms of technology mm -hmm. and in terms of culture and cultural production and in terms of systems, administration, uh, very, very sophisticated. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the question is, the next level would be to say, how can they come together as a sort of a, a totality mm -hmm. in, the, in the sense that not only Korea is going to be a more advanced country, but to create sort of a new civilization. Mm -hmm. And to do that, which I think Korea has the potential, mm -hmm. requires you to go back and find your own tradition. Mm -hmm. it, it can't be importing some other culture. It mm -hmm. has to come back to where did it begin. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that the idea of uh, drawing from past experiences like, mm -hmm. and learning from either past mistakes or mm -hmm. uh, from past successes is so important to helping to guide the present and the future. And um, by, by what you're saying, um, it it's, seems like it's a real passion of yours to make sure that people nowadays know what's going on mm -hmm. uh, or what has gone on in the past. Right, right. Uh, why do you feel so passionate about that? Uh, well, I think it's a it's not just a Korea issue, it's a, mm -hmm. it's a global issue. Mm -hmm. There's uh, the anthropologist uh, uh, Jared Diamond, mm -hmm. uh, he recently wrote a book called uh, The Way We, we Live Before Yesterday, I think mm -hmm. it was, uh, and basically he talks about the incredible know-how in traditional societies mm -hmm. and how we can apply that to the mm -hmm. present day. Mm -hmm. In the Korean case, uh, we have, for example, Koreans go to Germany to learn about Echo cities, mm -hmm. uh, and they think, well, we can learn something from Germany or, or Sweden mm -hmm. or Finland. But in fact, Seoul, mm -hmm. Hanyang, was one of the most sophisticated echo cities in the world, mm -hmm. uh, with almost 100% recycling, uh, incredible efforts mm -hmm. to retain uh, soil. Mm -hmm. And as you know, things like 
human waste at all. We're all 100% recycled mm -hmm. uh, into the farming process, which mm -hmm. we don't do anymore, although mm -hmm. we probably should. Right. So there's and it's looked upon as uh, just uh, un unsanitary. That's too, right, right. Which, which is a total mistake. Mm -hmm. It was an incredibly smart system to do. Mm -hmm. So the question is, if we wanted to go back to something like that, mm -hmm. we don't we dispose of our waste in a way which actually helps our society and preserves the environment. Mm -hmm. We don't have to go somewhere else, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We just have to go and look at the past here in Korea. Mm -hmm. Now, you're currently living in Korea, and uh, you've lived uh, in different parts of Asia, yes? Japan and China, um, mm -hmm. and also Taiwan. Correct. So, despite the fact that these countries uh, have had a long history together, mm -hmm. thousands of mm -hmm. years, mm -hmm. there are you know, significant differences between right. the three of them, or four, including right. uh, Taiwan. Mm -hmm. and. What is your opinion of how uh, Korea situated, uh, not just uh, geopolitically, but from a cultural standpoint? Right, right. Well, so Korea uh, is a distinctly vital part of Asia. I think we can say very clearly that culture emanates from Korea and radiates out. That didn't used to be the case. I mean, 30 years ago, new fashions or literature would start in Tokyo and sort of percolate and mm -hmm. spread out through Asia. But now, really, I think Seoul is, I don't know, ground zero is the right word for it, but it starts, mm -hmm. often it starts here, like, like somewhere, the hub. <laughs> somewhere there in Shinsadong, right, mm -hmm. is where some new culture sort of bubbles up and then spreads out. So it, it has that sort of uh, vitality. Why? I, I think there are two elements. One would be to say that there's a great cultural flexibility in Korea mm -hmm. because the Korean War and it's, there's, it, things got mixed up in a way. So, I mean, it's some, some sadness in that story, but Korea has a sort of vitality. You know, people went from the bottom to the top and top to the bottom. Uh, and the other aspect is, at the same time that Korea has been mixed up a lot, it's also retained much of the traditional culture mm -hmm. uh, to a degree that you don't find in other countries. Mm -hmm. So the purest forms of Buddhism, like mm -hmm. we talked about Heinsa, mm -hmm. it was preserved here in Korea. Mm -hmm. And the Confucian tradition too, mm -hmm. Songgyung Guan, basically much of the Confucian tradition mm -hmm. without much of a break mm -hmm. has been carried on to the present. Here we are at an international school located in Seoul where Emmanuel Pastrek was invited as a guest teacher. While you might think that he might be teaching about East Asian literature, surprisingly, he was here to teach about Buddhism. Uh, today, when we try and learn the original Buddhist texts, um, although the, they were originally written in Sanskrit and Pali, uh, not the, the texts that survive in, in the original Sanskrit. So when I first met him, he came up with some ideas. He was like, you know, I'd like to be of help with the school. And he told me about his past and background knowledge he's got. He just brings a level of expertise that myself as a classroom teacher I don't have. We have a pretty short time to cover a massive amount of time in history. And so he brings you know, a totally different ballgame to the classroom and gives a more in-depth look at Buddhism. Buddhism was not saying, was not promising you will feel no pain, right? It's assuming that pain is a part of all human experience. Uh, uh, but there were many of them. Uh, some of them. It was natural for Emmanuel, who had been studying East Asian literature for decades, to become intrigued by this culture. And he says that it brings him great joy to impart his knowledge to future generations. And so many people came, uh, they learned about this Buddhist teachings, and they traveled. Uh, from China uh, to uh, India. Shenzhen is from the Tang Dynasty is one of the most famous, uh, but there were many of them. Uh, some of them die, you get born again like an animal or a snake. And we follow Buddhist teachings instead of that thing. That is an excellent question. <laughs> that is an excellent question. Uh, and so you I think would it's say better because not only because some Asians tell about Buddhism that Buddhism is very good and he's kind of neutral about Buddhism so. I've never heard an American teaching an Asian religion and I'm thankful for the presentation and that he's a good presenter. 
While it isn't common for students in Korea to learn about Eastern culture from a Westerner, and that, I'm sure, made this experience all the more memorable for them. Now switching topics just a little bit more uh, for a personal look into your life, Manuel. Um, you've lived in Korea now a total for seven years, is that right? Uh, almost seven years. Okay. And when you first came to Korea, what was your impression? I, I hear that your impression of Korea at first wasn't all that positive. Well, so there was, the first time I came to Korea, it was not actually to live, but to mm -hmm. visit. Uh, yeah, it was pretty rough. Uh, people were uh, not that friendly. I had a lot of trouble speaking to Koreans because a lot of Koreans, they just feel inherently nervous when they talk to non-Koreans. So that was in 91, is that right? That was in 91 okay. the first time. And okay. you couldn't get good coffee, as you know. <laughs> the world has changed a lot. Now you <laughs> coffee is that important to you, is, yes? <laughs> well, it, 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 I mean, you, you know how, how Korea has changed in that mm -hmm. respect, uh, even in the last three or four years. Uh, so it was uh, difficult at first, yes. Mm -hmm. So um, I do want to talk about how you found it so interesting to really go deeper into Korean culture and history to find out that you know even way back in the Joseon Dynasty period people were planning for the future you know right. for a hundred years uh, right. in, into the Absolutely future right. um, but with with your coming to Korea and deciding to more or less be here for mm -hmm. an extended period of time mm -hmm. what was it that you found uh, particularly attractive about being here? Uh, well I think Korea is a uh, relatively open society, mm -hmm. and one of the most open societies in the world. Mm -hmm. Often, that makes Korea seem less open because all the bad things about Korea are broadcast in the newspaper. But I think that's positive. I mean, mm -hmm. that, that tells you just how transparent a mm -hmm. society it is. Uh, I think it has enormous amount of cultural vitality, mm -hmm. people are able to innovate. Uh, I worked, to give an example, I worked with Chungnam province. And Chungnam, as you may know, uh, Taejeon used to be the capital of Chungnam, mm -hmm. and then when Taejeon reached a certain population, they made it a metropolitan city, has a mayor, rank of a governor, yes. and then they moved the capital of, of Chungnam to Hongsong. Mm -hmm. um, in the case of the United States, uh, that sort of change, I think, hasn't happened in the last hundred years. Mm -hmm. It's not really possible. Or if you take Airx to to Incheon Airport. I mean, they've been trying to put a high-speed train from Manhattan to, to Kennedy Airport for the last uh, 45 years and <laughs> haven't been able to do it. But Koreans, they just, they're able to do things. And that, that sort of, you know, willingness to actually have, you know, ambitious, mm -hmm. far-reaching ideas, but at the same time to actually be able to implement them, mm -hmm. uh, that's what's really exciting about Korea mm -hmm. for us. When you've written your books, uh, you've written them uh, mostly in Korean, yes? And uh, they're, of course, published in Korean. And I'm curious about uh, your fascination with geomancy, or in Korean known as pungsu. Uh, why were you focused on uh, geomancy, and uh, what was the attraction there? Well, it's a fascinating topic. Uh, in pungsu, or feng shui, as they say in Chinese, mm -hmm. geomancy, it's tended to be in recent years the way you place the graves of people, right? So mm -hmm. Koreans have tended to think about, you know, for good luck, you want to arrange your grave in a certain way relative mm -hmm. to uh, north and south and mm -hmm. relative to the surrounding environment. And that's because uh, your uh, offspring and uh, the people that right. come after you will uh, gain benefits right. on well, some level. Uh, if you're planning your own right. grave, right. often you're planning someone else's grave right. from before, but basically the concept is in order to carry on that good luck for your mm -hmm. family, you have to have your grave well placed. Yes. And this is part of geomancy, mm -hmm. of, of pungsu, but it's only part. Mm -hmm. uh, it had originally basically had to do with the flow of water, the flow of air, soil, and the relationship between uh, different parts of the, in, uh, of the uh, ecosystem mm -hmm. and, and human communities. Mm -hmm. So it actually originally was what we call ecology. Yes. That was the essence of pungsu. Unfortunately, in many Korean cities, essentially we've ignored mm -hmm. that tradition. So we use it when we're designing tombs, <laughs> but we don't use it when we're designing cities, right? But in fact, 
the great wisdom and the great potential in that tradition is not in how to design graves, mm -hmm. which really, except for dead people, uh, are not really part of our daily lives, but rather how do we create ecologically mm -hmm. sound uh, cities which mm -hmm. can breathe hope, as we say in mm -hmm. Korean, right? Breathe uh, and interact with the natural world. Mm -hmm. And the traditional Hanok houses, traditional architecture, city planning of the past mm -hmm. offers that potential for human communities which are in harmony with nature itself. Mm -hmm. When you talk about geomancy and uh, feng shui, a mm -hmm. lot of people will think about you know, how to place certain objects even right. in the home, right. Right. Um, in addition to you know, uh, where to, to bury one's uh, uh, parents or right. ancestors. <laughs> right. and, uh, and while that's important to some extent, and there's some wisdom in that, um, your focus on feng shui or peng su, geomancy as uh, ecology is, is mm. quite interesting because that's something that has been carried on um, for uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years in, um, in the past, Absolutely. but has uh, essentially been really filtered down to something that is uh, much more superficial right. uh, on some level. And I'm curious how you uh, address that in your book and how you would like to help people to change their ideas of, of what peng su is. Right. So my purpose in the book is not to become an expert on Pungsu, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but rather to make the con contribution that I can make. Mm -hmm. And that is to highlight some parts which have been ig ignored or, or downplayed in recent years. Uh, so that's, that's really what I'm coming mm -hmm. at it from. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say that Korea has its own unique sort of Pungsu tradition in some ways quite different than what you find in China uh, and Japan. Mm -hmm. And that in Korea is the potential, as is the case in, say, traditional oriental medicine, for the redefinition of geomancy, ecology, traditional ecology, mm -hmm. or redefinition of traditional uh, medicine to create a wave which will not only change Korea, but transform the way, say, traditional culture is seen in Japan, China, and around mm -hmm. the world. So mm -hmm. it could start here. Emmanuel, in your book, uh, the newest book here, um, you talk about Hallyu. Now, mm. Hallyu has typically been considered uh, more K-pop, entertainment-driven, but right. uh, you also address it as um, globalizing the Korean Thanksgiving as well right. as uh, making Korean villages uh, much more international and right. making them into the Provence of Asia. And uh, it's, it's very interesting when you talk about that because that's something that uh, not many people have you know, addressed. Right, so that's the real potential, yeah. mm -hmm. I think. If you go to, say, rural, I lived in Chungnam, mm -hmm. of course, for four years, and I was always struck at how much the landscape, maybe it's more beautiful than Provence in some respects. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of delicious traditional foods there, but the issue has been that the villages, are, they haven't been really kept that neat and clean, and people haven't really made an effort to preserve traditional architecture mm. uh, so much. But if they did, if Korea did, I think a lot of these rural areas could be enormously popular in the way that Provence is. Mm -hmm. And that would mean, I think, I mean, for example, you go to, if you get like um, Tianjang or Kochujang or uh, what else, Jeonggukjang, uh, uh, right? Mm -hmm. Or Makori. Uh, if you went to a place and they said, well, we have this tradition, we've been making tenjang for 500 years, and you had a beautiful old house made of wood where they made it, mm -hmm. and you took a tour there, and you could spend the night at the, at the inn there, and it was a beautiful sort of traditional environment. Mm -hmm. I think it has enormous potential, mm -hmm. enormous potential. Now, with, uh, with a lot of the things that you address in your book, you definitely talk about how you, um, look at Korea from a different perspective than mm -hmm. what a Korean would. And uh, not only because you are uh, not Korean, but what is it about you that makes you look at Korea in a different perspective? Well, I think Korea is just is extremely important to me uh, personally. So I, I do care about Korea. Um, but I think maybe the difference from many other foreigners, Americans who spent time in Korea here is that I see the potential to be here, mm -hmm. right? That the real potential to make new culture, new civilization, new opportunities, that Korea is growing and mm -hmm. it's becoming very sophisticated very, very quickly. So I would say to all of our 
you know, viewers who are interested in opportunities that I, I just don't find any place more appealing, more fascinating. So it's not an accident that I, it's not because I like kimchi per se that I'm in Korea in, mm -hmm. as opposed to in, in Japan or China. I just found this, this sort of vitality and uh, that's uh, pal palpable here. Mm -hmm. In your books, you constantly kind of remind uh, Koreans that they need to rediscover, and mm. we've, we've spoken about this a little bit before, right. about rediscovering the past and bringing it into the future. What are some technological uh, advances from, let's say, the Joseon period that uh, people should really take a, a serious look at to see that um, Korea's development um, wasn't just in the past 60 years. Absolutely. And that it really was based from you know ancient traditions. Right. And of course, Korea came from the, uh, the ravages of war to mm -hmm. become what it is now through you know, various means. But uh, technology was always very important. How do you show that in your book to people? Right, so of course, Korea was a center for technology in the 13th, 14th, 15th century, mm -hmm. uh, and even later than that in many respects. Uh, but my book is not so much about say ancient technologies per se, mm -hmm. but rather the technology of how you run systems. Mm -hmm. And the Chosun, which lasted for 500 years in a relatively peaceful uh, environment in which there was this very strong sort of balance of power between the different institutions mm -hmm. and a relatively open environment. People could criticize the king. They were able to sort of interact in a way which is hard to find actually mm -hmm. in that period of time. This is very impressive. Mm. And some of the traditions, for example, the annals of the Chosun dynasty, the system in which you kept accurate records, or the whole tradition of propriety, mm. what they call yeha, which was this idea, know-how, for how to maintain good relations and be respectful to a large range of different people from different backgrounds. That was in the Chosun was about how to interact with your family and also within government or within institutions. Uh, but I think with a bit of creativity, we can take much of that knowledge and apply it to say the issue of uh, cyberspace, right? Mm -hmm. Or social networks. How do we maintain relations that are proper, mm -hmm. right? Because Sci World or social networks take you in all different directions with people you don't really know all that mm -hmm. well. So much of that knowledge, which is now asleep from the mm -hmm. Chosun dynasty, I think can be reinterpreted and used today. Mm -hmm. History is usually written by those who are in power, right. and uh, the losers don't usually have a say in mm -hmm. what the history is about. Mm -hmm. So when we are looking at the annals of the Chosun Dynasty, for example, we're looking at people's lives and uh, the details of everything that's gone on. But those are the, the winners that have written. Right. Now, in going to where we are in present day, um, we have different media reporting on what's happening. So uh, we have a lot of different sources of information of what is history. Right. What do you say to uh, a new or modern form of annals of the Chosun Dynasty, but annals of the Korean government <laughs> or U.S. government? Right. Well, I, it's a fascinating, this is one of my favorite topics. Unfortunately, it's a little bit protein in my mind because I've only started writing on this very recently. As you know, I mm -hmm. wrote only last week on an uh, article on the topic. Uh, but I think the potential is enormous. The potential is enormous. So if you had, I mean, today in this internet age, it's so hard to figure out what is accurate and you get all these different sources for information. So to set up a sort of a system mm -hmm. whereby you accurately re re record what happens in a reliable way, uh, I think it's going to be something for which there will be tremendous demand mm -hmm. uh, globally. Uh, and that if Korea could set a sort of a, a model for how mm -hmm. that could be done, mm -hmm. which is grounded in its own tradition, that that could be a model not just for how Korea mm -hmm. is run. Uh, and, and here, maybe I'll say something a little critical of Korea. Uh, there's a sad story about Korea, and that is that Korea has been an incredibly innovative country, but m often that hasn't really taken off in the way it could have. So Korea was the first country to develop metal movable type, for example, but although it was the first, it didn't become a global standard and essentially was lost uh, as, as a technology. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was sad. We had the same story with you know, with Sci World, which was the first social network system mm -hmm. 
very, very advanced, 2003, 2004. But ultimately, it was Facebook and not uh, SciWorld that was able to create a sort of a global standard for, mm -hmm. for how it, social networks would work. So I think the critical issue, if we're looking back at things like Pungsu Geomancy or the, the, the Annals of the Chosen mm -hmm. Dynasty or other institutions, is that this time it's not just for Korea, mm -hmm. but it's a global standard that we would be creating. Uh, it sounds like, uh, unlike a lot of uh, people who do come to Korea and um, enjoy you know, mm -hmm. living in Korea, that you've done a lot of research. I mean, it sounds like you read uh, quite a lot to be able to gain a lot of the expertise on these various subjects. Uh, how important is uh, reading uh, about Korean history and culture to you? Uh, well, so reading is extremely important. I, I wouldn't say I now do things like shows like this, so I don't read as intensely as I once did. I used mm -hmm. to basically read all day long. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would say for those who want to learn Korean or foreign languages, mm -hmm. the reading is, is essential that you should, uh, I would say, force yourself mm -hmm. to read constantly and read broadly because that's the only way you can get that sort of mm -hmm. real cultural depth. Mm -hmm. And one of the dangers is if you go in Korea, if you just go with the sort of the surface flow of Gangnam style or you know, fashionable clothes, that you miss mm -hmm. some of these long-term factors which are decisive in terms of how Korea has developed so far and how mm -hmm. it will develop going forward. Korea is about potential. There's tremendous potential here, I think, to create new systems, new culture, new lives, and a new civilization for our world. That potential is what draws us here, and I think that's what draws people from around the world to look to Korea uh, for inspiration. It's my country, and my children have grown up here, uh, they speak Korean, uh, and all around me is Korea. So uh, we're looking at Korea from the inside. It is the inner view. How did I meet my wife? This is personal. <laughs> okay, well, yeah, uh, so my wife uh, was a major in Korean music uh, and I was very uh, drawn to her because we both saw the potential in Korea's traditional culture. Uh, and I was working on Korean literature and she was working on Korean uh, music. Now she works more on Korean art, uh, but we're both interested in trying to introduce Korean culture to the world. You have uh, two children and I a do. lovely wife, uh, who you mentioned is very mm. much into the Buddhist uh, art and whatnot. Um, I'd love to learn a little bit more about your family. Uh, well, uh, you just mentioned my family. Uh, my wife is, of course, uh, is studying right now, writing her master's thesis. Uh, my son, who's in, in middle school now, uh, came here when he was six. Uh, and he has a uh, great interest in science, mm -hmm. in fact, picking up the long Korean tradition back to Sejong. Mm -hmm. uh, and my daughter, I think, is more of an artist. She likes to draw quite a lot. Uh, they've both been, uh, my son has been in both Korean and international schools. My daughter has been basically in Korean schools the whole time. That's very interesting um, that you have uh, two children who are going to two very different kinds of school systems. How did you choose, uh, or did they choose, to go to those different schools? I, I think it had to do, my, my son had gone, and this is not just me, mm -hmm. many Koreans also, who have children in school in places like the United States and come back had the same problem. If the children are too old, uh, they have a lot of trouble adapting to Korean education. Mm -hmm. uh, my daughter was 
two years old when she came. Mm -hmm. So I think it was very natural. This is what she's accustomed to. But my son, much, much harder. So he spent a year and a half in Korean school, mm -hmm. uh, but it was very difficult for him. With your children, um, I imagine that you and your wife uh, have talked to them about uh, being uh, biracial mm -hmm. here in Korea. Mm -hmm. um, how do you address yeah. that topic with uh, such young children? Ah, it's an incredibly difficult uh, issue, I, I think. Uh, I don't really want to dwell on that topic uh, mm -hmm. per se. Um, one critical issue is that those aspects of Korean culture which are unique or are, are worthy should be seen as universals. They're not about being Korean per se. Mm -hmm. And I have always stressed that with my, with my children. But I've also stressed with them uh, that uh, people are are blind. They, they don't do these mean things to you because they want to be mean. Mm -hmm. They literally cannot see mm -hmm. uh, or they cannot empathize with what your position is. Mm -hmm. Now going and talking a little bit more about you personally, Manuel, yes. I understand that uh, in addition to your given name that mm. you have a Korean name, Yi Man Yeol, and mm. uh, what is the meaning of uh, Man Yeol and uh, how did you come about with that name? Uh, well, so I'll, in reverse, uh, I received a name from my uh, father-in-law uh, just about the time that I got married mm -hmm. uh, in, in 1997. Uh, and I think it was a ritual becoming part of that family, of the E family, so mm -hmm. it's now my family. Uh, the words, the man means many, and yal is uh, sort of uh, Emotion is a yeolchang, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, passion. Mm -hmm. So that that was the origin of, of of the term. But of course, it's closest to my name, Emmanuel. Mm -hmm. I see. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, it's also meaning a man of many passions. Uh, yes. It has that that, that that significance to it, and yeah. it is, of course, my Korean name. So mm -hmm. when I'm in Korea, I, I in most cases, uh, when in Korea, uh, you should follow Korean customs. With your being able to see so many different perspectives and having lived in different countries, different Asian countries in particular, uh, it seems that you have uh, a much easier time of being able to step into another culture's shoes, mm -hmm. another perspective. Uh, do you feel that that's something that's uh, important for you to pass down to your children? Ah, absolutely. <laughs> Maybe it's the essential issue, right? How does how one uh, uh, adapts mm -hmm. uh, and I have also come to feel that although we're most aware of it when we're entering another country it's true within our own countries right mm -hmm. that there are these different cultures There's a culture of journalism mm -hmm. it's different than academics and different from business or mm -hmm. you know government uh, and so we should be very aware of these different cultures that exist uh, and think very carefully about how we craft our message so that it can be meaningful mm -hmm. and implementable mm -hmm. in these different cultures. Mm -hmm. Emmanuel, as a dad living in Korea, um, and the educational fervor that mm -hmm. most Koreans have, uh, which is uh, really unlike a lot of other places on the planet, mm -hmm. yes. um, what are some of your thoughts on the Korean educational system and uh, the, the super competitive nature? Uh, is this something that uh, you want to help foster in your kids? Is this something that uh, you find important to address with your children as well? Well, it's, I have mixed feelings about the education in Korea. Obviously, uh, the extremely high level of education in general is impressive. Uh, the most uh, the part that I'm most impressed with and that I'd like to emulate around the world is the way in which all Koreans uh, are, have a high level of education. There are no groups in Korean that are illiterate or really unable to function in the language, mm -hmm. which is not true for other countries, including the United States. So it, it's truly impressive. Uh, but there have been some real problems with Korean education mm -hmm. as well. And you've written about that in your I books have, too. I right? have. Uh, maybe the most serious has been uh, this focus on a very narrow sense of what knowledge is, mm -hmm. you know, certain kinds of knowledge only count. Mm -hmm. uh, and specifically, many children sadly spend years and years studying for exams, uh, but the emphasis is, has been just on passing exams. And because of the way you learn, mm -hmm. which is not interactive, uh, the memories uh, are short term. Yes. So 
Once you've taken the test and five years has passed, you've forgotten most of what you learned. So I think there's tremendous possibility in Korea, and I'm very impressed by much of the education mm -hmm. system here. So mm -hmm. I'm not critical across the board, but I think if education became more interactive, so you took the information you learned and you made something with it mm -hmm. or you thought about how the world works, that we could create in our children memories that would mm -hmm. last a lifetime mm -hmm. rather than being so much just once the test is gone, it sort of fades away. Now, as a father of two children, and you just mentioned that interactive education is really important, what mm -hmm. would be an aspect of interactive education? How well, would we see that? Right. So interactive would be in the sense that you learn some principle of, say, mathematics or physics, and then you go in your neighborhood and you do a little study and you say, this is how electricity runs through the house, mm -hmm. right? Or how water you know, flows in my neighborhood or things like that. Mm -hmm. Or you take it, I mean, the, the best way to create long-term memories, this is more physiological, is multiple mediums. Mm -hmm. So you learn, you hear it, you see it, you write it, you smell or touch it, mm -hmm. and you do it in multiple dimensions. The more yeah. different ways, tactile, yes. that you approach the information, the more likely you will be able to remember it long term. Mm -hmm. In addition to being an author and also a father, a, father, and, uh, most important. a husband mm -hmm. <laughs> and a professor, you also are the director of the Asia Institute. Yes. I'd love to learn a little bit more about what you do there. So the Asia Institute is a think tank here at now in Seoul. We have been running since 2007. Uh, our primary interest has been in creating an active discussion on issues that many think tanks have not focused on so much. Such as? Uh, well, how technology has changed the world and how our society mm -hmm. is changing, environmental issues and the future of the environment, mm -hmm. uh, and aspects of international relations which tend to be overlooked, like mm -hmm. technology or media, for example. Mm -hmm. Uh, moreover, uh, in many of our act interactions, we tried to bring in high school students, college students, young people to have them interact, mm. participate. Mm -hmm. When we did the interview, for example, the, the seminar with, with a Professor Noam Chomsky, mm -hmm. we had many uh, college students there who asked him questions directly and sort of got them into a direct dialogue. So mm -hmm. very important for us to give a chance yeah. for young people to be involved in the decision making, the policy process. Mm. Last but not least, if you had to say something about how you wish Korea would change in the future, what would you say? So there's a good answer I have for this question, and that is that Koreans need to realize that the Korean wave, how Koreans live their life, is impacting the entire world. Mm. People in Southeast Asia, in China, in Central Asia and the Middle East, they benchmark Korea for how they run their governments. They watch Korean TV to think about how they should live their lives. If the Korean wave that we create is one which inspires a peaceful society, and a, an equal and fair society, a society in which people are concerned about the environment and about the future, then all these people who are exposed to the Korean wave will follow in that and it can create a new civilization and a bright future for us. If we don't do that, if Korean wave is about consuming, if it's about selfishness, if it's about just looking out for yourself and having a good time, uh, that has consequences that go far beyond the 50 million people here mm -hmm. in South Korea. So that sort of awareness for young people in Korea to think that what they do on a daily basis has that much importance for the world, mm -hmm. that's what I really would like to see. Mm. Emmanuel, it's been such a pleasure to have you on my show, the interview, and to hear about uh, how you're really learning so much about the past to bring it to the present and future. And I really wish you all the best with your future books and your Asia Institute and all the students who are impacted by your teaching. So thank you again for being here. Thank you very much for having me. No problem. Take care. Thank you. <laughs>